what I would say probably a good 85% of all of our events in the downtown core happen in golf gardens. So things to think about is, um, is it a suitable spot? Is it a place that works for the event that I want to have? Um, you wouldn't want to have, you know, drag races in there or bicycle races in there because the paths aren't, aren't conducive to that. Um, even running races aren't really great. It's fantastic for doing quick rock walks around the block. It's great for festivals and markets and demonstrations. You know, it's very easily accessible. It's got great parking. Um, having said that, it doesn't have great parking, say, for if you have 20 large buses coming. So those are some of the things to think about when you're selecting your location. Some of the other things to note is when you're doing a special event, although I issue the permits, Record Culture doesn't actually necessarily approve the permits. I work as a one-stop shop. So basically what that means is you submit your application to Record Culture and then I work with all of the different departments throughout the city to ensure that everybody's aware of it and that everybody has their chance to approve the permit or make the proper changes or the, um, give the information that needs to be known by the organizer on what they can and can't do or what they should and shouldn't do at the, at the location. So one of the things under the Parks Bylaw is you cannot run a business out of public land. So you cannot make money off of public land. That doesn't mean that you can't charge an admission for a race, or you can't charge for face painting, or what it means is you can't block off the entire area and charge a gate admission. Because then you're running a business or you're creating um, a lack of access to the general public because you're saying they can't come in unless they pay for it. So that's when you'll want to look at a private location. Um, the other thing to look at is what type of amenities are there. So at Elk Gardens, for example, we do have full bathrooms, and there are, I believe, seven of them there. Um, we have electricity, we have water, there is a kitchenette, uh, there is a PA system, there are tables. If you needed a place that had 150 chairs, we don't have that. So, or if you needed a place that had um, big open spaces, there's a lot of trees in Gulf Gardens, that uh, maybe wouldn't work for you as well. So you need to look at those things when you're setting things up. You also need to look at things like, if I put this area here, how does that impact the flow of where everybody goes? So when you're setting up, you want to make sure that there are sight lines from one end of the park to the other. You don't want to have a bunch of stuff blocking off, per se. Um, and I think we will end up talking about that a little bit as well. That uh, when you do that, it makes it very hard for them to monitor in the park or for uh, volunteers of the events to monitor what's going on if they can't see through to other areas and see if other people in their event need help or what's going on in the different areas. So you always want to be aware of where you're putting things and how you set them up. Um, you also need to be aware of any damage or uh, impact on the environment that you may have with this event. We will restrict activities that we think will have a negative impact on the environment or on the space. So if you were wanting to bring in um, motorcycles in the gardens, we would probably say no or find a different location just because it would tear up the grass and that's not, not great. If you wanted to have a styrofoam festival, we would probably say no. That is one of the initiatives we've been working really hard on uh, with ourselves with Wrecking Culture and our waste and recycling department is to uh, ban styrofoam from all of our public events. So, so far Canada Day has started it and I know some of the other events in the city that are run by city organizations have also done that. So, you know, just little things to think about. Um, The city of Lethbridge, um, the city of Lethbridge does not provide security for special events. We highly recommend that you have your own, and what that means varies upon each individual event. 
Um, AGLC and fire prevention, they have uh, occupancy loads, they have ratios when you're doing things for, for example, beer gardens, um, and those are outside of the special event permit. However, uh, as I talked earlier, that I get approvals from different departments, um, that is something that we take into account when we're issuing the permit. So if you've got a beer garden and it's X number of square feet, under AGLC it says you need to have this many security or supervisors. That's something that we take into account when we issue our permit. Uh, same with the uh, fire prevention. They have rules on entrances and exits and how many people you can have. They consider it a building as soon as you add fencing. They consider it an enclosed area. So those are some of the things that you'll need to check in on. Most of that information is online under the AGLC website or uh, fire prevention has it on our website as well. There is security that the City of Lethbridge does hire every year for Gull Gardens and for the downtown area. Um, they are for the security of all the general public. Although they are in the park or in the area during your events, they are not there specifically for your event. So uh, a lot of groups have in the past relied upon them to be their security, and we highly recommend that that doesn't happen. Um, that is not their job, that's not what they're there for. They are there to ensure that everybody is safe in the city of Lethbridge, in the downtown core. Um, so when there's something that's, you know, uh, sorry, um, when there's something really large in the park, uh, like Pride Fest in the park, um, in the park, and there's, you know, several thousand people down there, the two security people that we have on staff that day, uh, they definitely don't have the ability or the means to control that large of a crowd or to monitor or to help out with that large of a crowd. So just to note that that is not what they're there for. If you are going to have money in any way at the park, we highly recommend, in anywhere, anywhere outside, we really highly recommend that you have a cash handling procedure and that you have somebody um, in charge of just that process and making sure that everybody is safe that has the money, people are safe, you know, paying, the, the cashiers, um, and that you have, you know, some controls and somebody there that can help out with the situation if necessary. Um, there are two different types of security. There is your volunteers, and there is a paid professional security. The type of event will depend on what type of security you really require, and that's something that you guys need to decide as the organizing bodies of the event. Uh, we would recommend um, Volunteer security would be for like a small event. You know, you just have a couple people making sure, going rounds, um, as a cell phone. Uh, there are some phone numbers. Um, we're on a different page, I'll get to those later. Uh, I do have some phone numbers in some areas that you can jot down on a different slide here that'll show you what you can use. The other thing to note is, especially when you're getting to the bigger events, is do you have an evacuation plan? And a lot of events haven't thought of this in the past, and it's something that can be uh, really necessary. If you have several thousand people in the park for your event, even if you have 500 people and um, a monsoon hit, which we have seen here in you know the Canada Day on 2008, how are you getting all of those people out of there? Um, and uh, you know, or. I know one of your fire barrels gets kicked over and you just have to start a tree off. I don't know. All of these things can happen, you never know. Um, you should think about an evacuation plan. Having people on the organizing committee that are aware of what to do and that can stand up and lead that force of, okay, everybody follow me, or you know, these are the phone calls we have to make. If you assign one person to that or two people to that, then they can stand up and take the lead. Um, for Canada Day, we actually had one done through the fire department, through fire prevention, uh, and a consulting firm. And so it is one that was done that was adaptable. So if anybody is interested in that, you can let me know after and I will email it to you. It is specifically set up now for Canada Day, but it has been designed to be adaptable for any event or any location. You would just change your muster points and your people's names in it. So if you're interested in something like that, please let me know. Um, it is something that uh, not a lot of groups think about, but is really important under security. Um, 
some of what I have will overlap with some of the other groups. Um, the City of Lethbridge on the application form does ask you for a on-site safety supervisor. The safety supervisor is the person that would take care of uh, any first aid requests, any evacuation requests, making sure that um, if you have activities there that they're being done in a safe manner. Uh, they're basically your insurance company, if you have insurance for your event, which you should, uh, usually requires this and they will require it in several different ways. The City of Lethbridge, although we ask for it, it's not a, a mandatory requirement, but it is a highly recommended suggestion that you have this in place. Uh, it doesn't have to be a professional. I mean, uh, um, if you do have a professional on site like St. John's, that's fantastic. Uh, and that's a really good option. If you have somebody that has, if you have, you know, 10 people on your organizing committee that all have standard first aid, if you have a, st a first aid kit, most of your things you'll probably end up calling 911 from what we deal with at Canada Day. Uh, I should mention I chair Canada Day for the City of Lethbridge, so I reference that one a lot just because that's the event that I'm most familiar with. I spend a lot of time with it. Um, <coughs> You should, during your event, have somebody that's a site manager on site all the time that is always running around to all the different areas and just double checking, making sure everybody's okay, making sure everybody's safe, making sure that there's no issues. And then uh, we recommend about every half hour, every you know, 20 to 30 minutes, that that person is, is roving around the site so that they can ensure that everybody is, is doing what they need to do. I did compile this list here for people. Um, there are some places that are really great within our city that we can call uh, that will help us with some of our situations that may arise. So Legal Pickup, of course, has the Arches. Um, they run that program for us. There is the 911 emergency. Uh, there is the complaint line with LPS. There is also a downtown P uh, beat number, but I. Um, find it yesterday when I was trying to finish this presentation, but there is also that number that will get you right to the downtown core um, staff. There's the Clean Sweep program that I know they're fantastic and I'll see you do a lot of work with them. And uh, so, you know, before or after your event, lots of times she'll help you with that, that they can come in and they can help make sure the park is safe for your event before it starts. Um, and then just making sure that you have your designated volunteers or designated committee members for your security and safety on site. Um, the other thing I was asked to talk about was beer gardens, everybody's favorite and least favorite thing all in the same thing. Um, they are a great way to make money, don't get me wrong, they are a fantastic fundraiser, but there are a lot of logistics that go into it and uh, a lot of times groups don't realize the um, significant impact it can have on A, their volunteer base, uh, and be the type of crowd that they can um, entice sometimes. They are fantastic, they're social, they're engaging, they're, um, they're money makers for sure, um, but they are a lot of work, and so you need to know that before you get into it. If you go to the AGLC website, uh, they actually give a lot of information about beer gardens and what their rules and regulations are around it. And they will come out and uh, check them out. And we have had some of them either shut down or delayed start because they haven't had everything in place. So just make sure when you're doing them that you think of the whole picture. Does a beer gardens really fit with my event? Am I prepared security-wise and safety-wise to have that many people with alcohol in the space? And uh, is it something that we can work with the other agencies like the police. Um, they'll want to know, can they see through a beer gardens? Is it hidden? You know, all those different things. So we work with our, our park staff on location a lot and with the fire prevention and the police to make sure that it can be successful for everybody in there. The last part of it is insurance. Um, the City of Lethbridge does have an event liability insurance policy that we um, have obtained through Recreation and Culture that covers small groups or small events. 
Anything that has alcohol, we are not allowed to include. It doesn't, it isn't covered on this. But it'll cover anything from your basic walks and runs or rallies, demonstrations, um, uh, Latin Fest in the park. No, Latin Fest has a beer gardens. Um, I don't think it was. I don't have beer gardens right now. Walk a mile in our shoes. Yeah, walk a mile in our shoes. Any of those ones, we have the ability to cover the liability insurance on that. However, we do highly recommend for your own sake and your own safety that you do get your own. Uh, you get it at any registry office, so you can talk to any insurance agent. Um, they have about 800 different types. I get asked a lot, who can I recommend or where do I get it? To be honest, it's, I've seen them cost anywhere from 100 to 3,000. And, and I have yet to figure out in 20 years the rhyme or reason to what costs what. Um, I think it varies depending on who your insurance agent is, how many years you've been with them, what are the policies, if you're a registered not-for-profit, um, the, the risk of your event. So just know that you really need to talk to them. Uh, we do have a $2 million minimum liability and that we do want the City of Lethbridge uh, included as an additional insured. If you do have questions about insurance, though, we do have a, a, an IRM department, risk management department, and they are always more than willing to help out me with any of the groups and explain the policy that we currently have that we can include you in or help you to better understand the insurance that you would need to get for the event that you're doing. I think that's all I have for today. I did bring some application forms if anybody is interested in applying for more events. I do have some at the, I'll leave at the back table. All right, so um, just to give you a little bit of my background, I'm actually a firefighter and paramedic. I volunteered for many years with Bubble Bird. I'm the Vice President of Public Relations and Business Development at St. John Ambulance. But I'm also a volunteer at uh, part of the ER the emergency response units for both uh, the Red Cross, St. John Ambulance, and MAP. Um, deployed internationally to Haiti, Africa six times, Afghanistan, but specifically here in our province in Alberta to a lot of our natural disasters where we've had floods, fires, uh, Fort McMurray, certainly here in southern Alberta where we've had fires and floods. So when we talk about first responders and what emergency response preparedness is, I'd speak from both a personal experience, uh, but also my role with St. John Ambulance. We work with many, many organizations to ensure that they are prepared. Um, and we also provide first aid coverage. And so when I talk about first aid coverage uh, through St. John Ambulance, I just want to start out to let you know, first of all, we do not charge for our services. They are provided voluntarily. If you're able to donate, that's awesome. That's how we fund our units, which a lot of people call ambulances. Uh, for each volunteer that we develop is approximately $1,500. And per annum, we probably, in southern Alberta, so Lethbridge and immediate areas, we probably go through close to $40,000 worth of medical supplies. Um, so those are covered by our organization. They are not covered um, by any government program. The City of Lethbridge does provide us a grant, which we sincerely appreciate. And uh, we use those monies to put directly back into community services. So I uh, just wanted to start out with that. So just for definition purposes, uh, for my con uh, conversation with you guys for about the next 25 minutes, when we talk about health, that's to make sure that people are in that state of wellness, both physically and mentally. First aid is the emergency treatment given to a person who needs assistance. The first aider is the person who chooses to assist them. And mental, pardon me, medical health is, or definitive care, or what we do to support that person. Sometimes it's just by calling 911. Other times it might be where we're actually just reassuring them. 
or in some cases it may be where we're actually actively doing first aid for them. And obviously with, uh, when we look at very um, significant care, it could be from anywhere from triaging through mass casualty, um, CPR, or in some cases when people are not uh, successful in the care where per, uh, casualty does die, sometimes it's just providing that dignity to the body until such time as it can actually be removed. Next slide, please. Um, so when we talk about the casualty, it's the person who requires assistance. Um, from a legal perspective, not from maturity or anything else, just how we medically look at casualties. So an adult is anyone over the age of eight years old, a child is between one and eight years of age, and an infant is under the age of one year. We also have neonates, uh, but those are typically not what we would see in public venues. They are the firstborn, uh, sometimes premature ones. In Alberta, we have the Emergency Medical Aid Act, which is a piece of legislation. And I do want to cover this because lots of times we get not only questions, but certainly at events, people are a little confused sometimes about do I have a duty to respond versus what is that volunteer. So in the province of Alberta, in the 1980s, our government put in place an act called the Emergency Aid Act, which means that Good Samaritan or that person who is going to try their very best to offer assistance that they do not have a duty to respond will be covered under this. They cannot have any kind of gratuity or pay, and uh, there are a few things that you must do. First of all, you must identify yourself and get permission, either implied or informed. Implied means they're unconscious, they're not able to support them, uh, their decision making, or uh, informed, basically, yes, I'm telling you, you can help me. When we deal with that child and infant, if the parent is not there, you have permission to assist. It's under the local parentis, uh, and that just basically means in the absence of the parent, you can do what's best for that child uh, until definitive care or that parent can be there. Um, and it's also important to make sure that you can only stay within your scope in which you've been trained. So if you've been trained in emergency first aid or standard first aid, that's the scope you stay in. Uh, even though I'm a paramedic, when I'm volunteering with St. John Ambulance, I'm a uh, medical first responder, which means I understand St. John's and uh, St. John Ambulance's scope of practice, and that's what I stay in. But my quality of care, should it ever go to a legal uh, court, would be that to the tools, to my ability, did I give that same level of care that my training should be there. So. If you look at what the difference is between your work environment at a public function or through the Emergency Medical Aid Act, if you have a duty to respond, so police officers, firefighters, uh, EMS, you have a duty to respond while you're on duty, you are not covered under the Emergency Medical Aid Act. You're covered under your employer. If I am a ski patroller and I'm volunteering my time and not being paid, I'm under the Emergency Medical Aid Act. Even if I am a firefighter, police officer, paramedic, and I'm on my own time and I volunteer my time, I'm under the Emergency Medical Aid Act. Duties to respond. So the work environment responds in Alberta, all work environments, and so this would be the um, public gatherings as well, must have a designated first aider. Uh, as was just in the presentation ahead of you, or ahead of me, pardon me, um, it is absolutely critical that you understand that it is both legislated and requirement that you have somebody assigned. Now that person could be an emergency first aider, it could be a standard first aider, it could have somebody from our organization come and fill that role, it could be a doctor or nurse, somebody who has the skill and understanding that this is an emergency and the requirements uh, that are required to be uh, part of that response. <clears throat> Pardon me, public first response. All approved public functions have to have this component to it. Uh, you also have to look at your egress or your emergency response. And uh, as already stated, what's that environment like? So let me give you an example. If we had a pop up event that we weren't expecting, so there's a rally where people are really ticked off and they start to riot. We've seen that in the Red Mile, we've seen that in White Avenue, we've seen that in our province. All of a sudden things get out of control. How are we going to look at that public safety for the people that are in the bars or those beer gardens? We obviously can't control everything, but it's about understanding how we can protect our perimeters, how we can provide care and our communications. 
Mass casualty and disaster response, mutual aid agreements are all things that are um, in place in the province of Alberta and for every municipality, city, town, council, and county. So being part of the workplace, the emergency response plans, have to look at what is likely and what is going to uh, basically be your areas of responsibility, specifically for medical care, for those that are as old as I. In 1997, we had the big floods here happening. We lost the bridge, right? Uh, we could no longer put uh, people across the bridge. And so we had to look at setting up, oh, um, uh, they're called polyclinics, but basically like a small hospital across on the west side, because we didn't have that at that time. Uh, we looked at the medical clinics. We looked at how are we going to get people back and forth because the bridge was deemed unsafe because of the high waters. So sometimes when we look at our, even our events, when we've had the fires, just even a couple of years ago, we know it was a mass fire. We have them coming up through the Cooley. I remember it was at White Horse concert at South Minster United Church, and uh, all of a sudden the, the Cooleys are on fire. People had to leave. We smell this boat. All of a sudden, the emergency response plan is over the concert, right? If we have to evacuate, this is where we need to go and shelter in place. So again, having those plans and those events are critical um, as far as um, from a first aid perspective and a safety perspective. So the objects of first aid and care at any event. First of all, to preserve life. When we look at the preservation, it's not to put yourself in harm's way. It's not to do more than you can. And we see many injuries to people that happen because they're offering first aid and they forget to look at the hazards around them. I was driving up to Edmonton one uh, day, it was in the fall, there was a vehicle that had spun out. Uh, people stopped their vehicles to assist. Uh, one lady got out of her vehicle without looking, she stepped across Highway 2 northbound, was hit, she was killed. The person with whom uh, people were stopping to help, including myself, had stopped to look to tra clear traffic. So often we get such tunnel vision, we forget what is happening. So when we look at our own events, if there's alcohol, drugs, the raves, uh, big concerts that you anticipate, uh, more substances that might alter <coughs> compliance as well as um, ability to, to manage, you want to have more first aiders. You want to have more people. You want to have them in s sections that are uh, segregated to areas in which they would, uh, if they're on the mosh pits down the floor versus ones that are sitting hot in the, the bleachers. Those all have different criteria, different access and ability to respond. Um, we also want to prevent further injury, so getting people isolated, getting the crowds away, so often we don't think about that. And so when you're at events, think about how do you give that dignity and isolation to care. Uh, we often recommend people look at even putting a small medical tent or a room that is designated so that if you are treating a person, if you have to expose them, you can do so with both the dignity and the appropriate care. Part of first aid and care is obviously to promote recovery. So I'm just going to give you an example. At a lot of events, you'll have people, especially runs, um, if it's hot days like the air shows, my goodness, or cold, you sometimes can have a lot of diabetic issues because people don't eat, they drink too much, they're eating things they shouldn't or they're drinking things they shouldn't be. And we can actually sometimes provide treatment right on site, such as giving them glucagon or sugars or IVs, and what it does do is that puts that person back into balance and they don't even have to leave the event. Uh, sometimes the first aid can be such that we can bandage them up, do some skin closure, and they can stay at the event. So when we talk about promote recovery, we'd still always go and recommend them to go to see a doctor afterwards. And that should be part of your plans when you're looking at things. If you're coordinating the medical, make sure you always do that evaluation. So who and where should you suggest they go, especially if you're dealing with children or younger people. Uh, we also want to make sure that you're looking at pathogens and prevention. How many of you would even think to put a sharps container in your events, especially if these are public gatherings? And in some of the public washrooms, we do see the yellow hazard fibers. <coughs> you put your diabetic needles and whatever else in. But if you're out in the coolie areas down in the river bottom, if you've got a medical aid <coughs> area, really consider putting a sharps container there um, just so that the needles or other apparatuses, um, biohazardous uh, materials can be kept and it makes it safer for everyone. Um, and obviously, just as a note to everybody, maintain your immunizations and personal health uh, as well. 
So safety concerns, your personal safety always has to come first. So no matter how trained you are, what the events are, what your roles are, always look for your first and most foremost, your own safety. Um, I actually was up in Fort Mac just by happy chance when the fire started. And at first people didn't realize how serious they were going to be. Once the smoke and the fire started coming down the hill, they had dropped the river, mass chaos started, right? But people lose sight sometimes of the mass uh, requirements, uh, even how smoke can affect you. If you've got asthma, if you've got other underlying medical conditions, sometimes your ability to actually move or respond will be limited. Um, at events, sometimes, again, you take into consideration the lack of mobility. How ambulatory are people? Are they in wheelchairs? Do they have the ability, maybe they've got heart conditions, that they can walk short distances or very slowly? Have you looked at your egress plan to say, where should these people be sapped? Where should these people and the first aid uh, response and teams, uh, police vehicles, ambulances be staged so we can actually access where the greatest risk is? Um, also, to make sure that uh, we have communications, that we have control measures in place, and these are really, really important. To know what your standard operating procedures are, access to personal protective equipment, engineering controls, and these are from audible alarms, lighting. Um, I've been in certainly uh, many public event, uh, events, pardon me, in facilities, which they thought emergency lighting, and that's all fine and dandy, but what if people haven't actually checked them? What if they're not working? What if it's such a catastrophic event? that those are not working. Do you have access to a flashlight? Um, a lot of people will think of the cell phones with the lights, and that's awesome. But if you're actually trying to provide first aid care or emergency care uh, to get people to come towards you, uh, follow my voice, come towards me. If I have a light that's different than most, like a red light or a green light, people know what to look for, and they can actually come towards you. I was doing uh, medical coverage at one of the music festivals in Edmonton which is on a ski hill there, and uh, storms came in, lightning, they had to close down, and then the winds came, and a lot of the structures blew over, the big speakers did, and uh, we were trying to coordinate that evacuation process. And the more planned you are, and the more devices you have, especially engineering controls, which are loudspeakers, lights, um, stage signage, uh, exits, all of those things will help expedite that. If there's medical care, understanding how to stage them. Um, next slide, please. So communications, these are huge and all public events should consider this. Um, basically, who, who's going to communicate on behalf of you? You don't want 10 people phoning 911. You've got one assigned person who will have accurate information. They're the person in control and they're the ones that will give most of the information. If you've never had to call 911, you may not know that when they answer, they will, they will ask you, do you need police, ambulance, fire? What is the nature of your emergency? The more information you have, the quicker your response will be and the right people coming. If you don't have all that information, we're sometimes using up more resources than we actually need. And in some cases, actually can delay the appropriate response or the, thought, um, the correct response. Also consider part of it, the casualty. Lots of times the casualty can assist themselves, especially if there's lots of people injured. Um, bystanders can often be delegated and designated to areas. So when we do the MCIs with the multiple casualty incidents, we use color coding, which is on my next slide. And uh, people who are in the green zone, <laughs> Use the other people to help them. So if I've got a broken leg, I've got a small bleed, if I'm just emotionally distraught, and you've got somebody who's more calm, cool, and collected, get them to sit with that person and talk to them. Those are things we want to consider. Family members can also be a hindrance, and they can also be a great asset, especially with small children. Um, other first aiders and medical professionals that are on site, uh, I've flown many, many times where there's been medical emergencies, and the first thing they do is there's a doctor and nurse on board or other medical professional. If you identify yourself, all of a sudden, guess what? They're handing you that responsibility. At your events, there's nothing to preclude you from doing the same thing. If the event uh, that has occurred is bigger than you thought the first aiders were your plan, ask for additional resources until the city or the other event uh, managers can be on site. Um, emergency services, uh, making sure that you understand that they come at different level of response and different um, 
levels of uh, personnel. So again, the more information you have, the quicker your response will be. Um, also with media, I really encourage all of you guys to make this part of your plan. So if something does go amiss, who is going to speak to the media and who is not? You cannot control uh, what people post on their phones and to social media, but from your event, from uh, the city's perspective, and certainly from the organizations, you should have a designated uh, person, especially if there's death or significant injury, that they will be the ones and they will do it in a very planned and uh, progressive manner. So I've just put these up here because you may not be aware of them. And these are being used more and more as part of event planning as well as uh, certainly in uh, disaster response. So above there is the Alberta Health Services and these are used actually right across the world. Uh, some of them vary slightly but uh, you would certainly find these. At most of the public buildings I know at the Spartaplex, uh, certainly with uh, some of the other facilities, you will see the different color codes. The reason why these are being used more and more, especially in Canada, is our multiculturalism. Even if I don't speak the language, I can actually know if it's blue, I know what's happening, so by the color. If it's by purple or yellow, those things tell me right away if I've been trained or if I know that's part of my response. The colors will tell me what's happening. Um, also, as part of the color codes, they typically are announced three times. So, for example, if I was in uh, one of the facilities here in the city of Lethbridge and we had a fire, we'd have code red, code red, code red, and people know what they're doing. The reason why we give multiple repeat is sometimes things can cut out, sometimes we don't hear things, uh, only hear part of it. So, by having those repetition of uh, Sometimes we do, um, do the phonetic as well, so you'll hear like Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, etc. Those are again so that we clearly understand what the spelling of the emergency is. Next slide. Uh, mass casualty. We do a lot of responses both here in the city of Lethbridge as well as uh, within the county for mass casualty. We use color codes and tags that go to the feet. And uh, internationally, we use either the four or the three colored ones. And uh, black means death or no care. In the event we're using the three colored one, if the person is dead or there's no care, then they would just be marked green. The reason why we do it by priority is so that we can stage people so the ones that are survivable and have the greatest injury will be transported first. If I had multiple organ issues uh, or injuries, I would probably be marked green because there isn't enough resources to attend to my injuries and my needs quick enough. And so again, at many, especially when we have big gatherings, Canada Day, when we look at some of the big events we posted, uh, look at, again, what would happen if we had an act of terrorism? Edmonton two years ago certainly had that at a public event outside of Commonwealth, uh, where they did have an officer hit by a vehicle, four other people in Jasper Avenue hit. That was just at an everyday event. These things can happen, and these are things truly unfortunate, and we need to start to put into our plans, uh, not only for emergency response, but for first aid. Um, so if somebody is injured but it's not safe, that person stays. We're not going to put another person in harm's way to come to their aid until the uh, security is there, as well as the first aid abilities to manage that injury. So I've just put these up as to the steps of what uh, scene management contains. So what basically the scene, uh, what we want you to do so as part of your plans, always take, first of all, the history, so what's happened. And this is just the patient's history. This is the history of what was it, a fire, explosion, an attack, a heart attack, a drowning. Uh, those are things we want to know what's happened, what the hazards are. You always control the hazards first. What our responses are. Who do we need? Who's going to control the scene? Who's going to give the first aid? Who's going to be the communicator? Who's going to give the ongoing care? If family are there, how are we going to de deal with that? I covered medically at a, um, a hockey tournament about 10 years ago, in which we had a young hockey player go into the board. Immediately we knew there was problems because not only did he not move, but he started to convulse uh, it, and, and uh, to cardiac posturing, which means we knew that there was spinal or head concerns. You sure don't want family down there. You want family to get the history, but you don't want them intervening. And so sometimes you have to look at your emergency response plan as to who's also going to support that. 
primary assessment, airway, breathing, circulation, we teach that first aid, and those are things to make sure that uh, are in place, because if we don't have an open airway, nothing else is going to matter. So that's why we do it. Secondary surveys, again, just to make sure if we've got time. The more information we have of the event to pass on to EMS, uh, the better care that person will have. So do they have a heart rate? Were they conscious? Did they go unconscious? Did they regain consciousness? Were they confused? That type of information is extremely important. And then ongoing care. So roles and responsibilities uh, during an emergency. Take charge, address the hazards. Um, again, these are things you should already know and as was the presentation before me. What are those hazards? If you are doing an event at the river bottom, how much access do we have? Um, I went off my mountain bike, I do a lot of mountain biking, and uh, last, last year in the fall of 2018, we were riding along the single track on the coolies there, which has a very, very steep drop off. My bike went over, I went over, I actually um, had fractures in my vertebrae in C4, 5, and 6. I broke my arm and I broke my ribs. Um, we were about a kilometer in with zero access. I never even thought about boats. <laughs> But, oh my God, when I regain consciousness, right? They're gonna have to get a helicopter in here to get me out because you're not coming in with a quad. That's just down on a river bottom. So sometimes when we look at events, look at the whole access of how are we gonna get people in and out of there? Um, because sometimes you're not gonna walk out and sometimes you're not gonna be able to get the ambulance or the police or even the bike patrols down there. Um, when we also look at major events, um, in fire departments, we use hats, uh, colored hats. A white hat is a person in charge of it, is typically your lieutenant or captains. Uh, yellow hats are the worker bees. So even without knowing or being able to read name tags, we can see who's in charge. No different than vests. St. John Ambulance, we use green vests uh, to identify us as first aiders. We've got it across our back, and we also see name tags. And uh, basically ask, um, assess the scope of the incident. Um, for additional resources, and again, we all use those types of um, visuals, so it's very easy. I don't have to know if it's a police or a fire. We will be able to see who's in charge, especially with MCIs. Um, so basically, community responses. If you are doing such a large event, we just hosted the World Curling. Uh, we certainly covered a lot of the medical there, and what we often think of are just the participants, which are typically covered by those that are actually hosting the event or the teams themselves. But look at the spectators. How many spectators do you expect? How many um, other risks that we might be looking at? Motorsports, water sports. What are the chances of that event causing additional injury to those that are watching? Take those into consideration. <coughs> So um, this I do want to touch base on because we often host events, even if something very traumatic has happened, we all forget the mental first aid that has to happen, not only at the event itself, but uh, sometimes way after. I'm going to share something that um, is, is uh, certainly maybe not common. I see two police officers here and I, I really have a lot of empathy for sometimes uh, what they have to go through. And um, on Friday, a uh, very close friend of mine and um, member of our, our extended family took his life by job, jumping off the bridge on Friday. There were police officers present at the time trying to talk him off. Even though Sean took his life, um, it's the police officers that my concern would be for at this point because they witnessed a person take his own life in a very traumatic and, uh, event. We see these things happen sometimes in very public access. We see and know these things that happen in our work environments. So when we look at how do we take this into consideration, um, I have been at events where people have lost their lives, cardiac arrest, hockey tournaments. Um, I've seen people that have taken their own lives um, in very, very public fashion. So when we look at uh, personal involvement at the event, not only what would impact them, but people they work with and people they live with. Uh, repetitive exposure to events um, certainly are very difficult. And I personally have lived uh, in, when I went to, to Af Africa as well as to Afghanistan to see horrific uh, loss of life. In Haiti, I moved dead bodies for uh, close to four days and we were piling them 
by gender, age, and uh, area in which they lived. Those things are not easy to come home to and resume your life uh, in your everyday. So we have to look at how we would internalize it. Mental wellness of the time of the emergency. And again, if you are hosting the event, you might feel some responsibility. What happens, especially if people are not well prepared, or if the first response was not what you thought it was be or what was in place. Ability to control the outcome is some of the biggest things that people struggle with. So take that into account. If people took a first aid course, they anticipate and expect to be able to control that outcome, and they often can't. Uh, recognize signs and symptoms of mental uh, health and emergency. As people start to change, if they become more withdrawn, they start to become less uh, aware of life itself, they will change patterns, they lack sleep. There's so many signs and symptoms. Um, take that into consideration, and uh, we encourage you to make that part of your plan as well. Uh, this is the CARE acronym, and many of you guys will uh, be familiar with them, uh, not only through first aid, but I do want to just point out the statistic at the bottom. We do know one in five Canadians uh, meet the criteria of mental illness diagnosed every single year. Those people will be attending your events, those people will be planning your events, and those people are working for you. So those are things to take into consideration. Uh, mental health uh, at work. Um, again, I do want to just touch on this because your events are usually event uh, work driven or community driven. And so these are things to put as part of your emergency response plan as well as one in five Canadians will have a mental illness uh, per year. So that's on an ongoing basis. 44% of all workers state that they've had mental challenges per year. 500,000 Canadians will miss work every single week due to mental illness or depression. Three out of every four short-term disability claims um, are related, and in Canada, $51 billion um, are associated with mental illness. So these are all aspects that can happen from first aid. So how to be prepared, basically, as already said, we're not gonna take the time to go through it. Know your egress, know your first aid, have your first aid kits and uh, be prepared and make sure you have designated people at the event. Um, and again, making sure that you put personal safety types of danger, make that part of your plan when you're doing your events. Uh, here in Southern Alberta we get winds especially, and uh, take that into consideration if it's an outdoor event, if it's an indoor event, temperatures, uh, toxins, and emergency response that you would need for engineering controls. Your staging, and I know I keep saying that, but your egress and staging will make the biggest difference. We see more, more people hurt at public events because we haven't thought about how people are going to get in or out, or we lock doors or we chain doors, and it's against fire code, it's against uh, emergency response, but people still do it, and that's where we see the increase of death and injury. Alright, so um, I think my time is up, so I won't bother showing the video, but um, again, thank you guys very much for the opportunity, and we're going to have time for questions afterwards, and uh, specifically if St. John Ambulance can be, first of all, uh, provided for state of your events, just make sure you put your applications in early. We get inundated at this time of year for requests, we only have so many volunteers, and it is not only just on a first-come, first-served basis, but on the magnitude of the, the size or scope. So if you do have an event, you do need St. John there. Uh, all you need is to put in your application, and as mentioned, there is no charge for it. Thanks. Sarah and Kim, our first two presenters. Obviously, a lot of a lot to take in. Um, as our event organizers, obviously, we don't want to overburden you with things that put you off from holding an event. But some early thinking will, will help everyone in the long term uh, avoid uh, of situations where you have to take on all of that information and try and process it. So, thank you again. So, I'll call up uh, Sergeant Baron Goodrich of LPS to talk really quickly on the LPS pay duty and alternative that you may not be aware of. 
Thanks, Andrew. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming out today. I feel it's really important that we get this information relayed out to you to host a good event and that we can have a fun time as well as uh, bring people into our city. So these are things that definitely help. Um, one thing that was mentioned earlier with uh, event security and everything, some, something that we have at the police service that maybe not a lot of people know is that you can actually hire us out privately to help you with your event for security for that event. Um, and as it states here, it's, it is a little bit costly, but you are getting us um, to help with your event, $130 per hour per officer with minimum pay for three hours. Now, we decide on how many officers are needed per event. So if you're hosting an event where there's several thousand people and you want one officer, that's probably not going to happen. We're probably going to have to do a schematic and take a risk assessment and see how many officers are going to need it to uh, help you out with that. Um, flat fee of $65 per officer for travel to get uh, to and from your event. Uh, if 48 hours notice is not given, then a $100 cancellation fee will be applied to your rate as well. Um, really importantly, when I was speaking with our uh, human resources manager, she wanted me to touch base on if there were to be a police incident to arise that is outside the parameters of the pay duty, that the police officers have an obligation to the citizens of Lethbridge to deal with that incident first, and the pay duty is a secondary um, responsibility of those officers. So I want to make sure that everyone knows that. So if you've got an officer or three at your event, something else breaks out, those officers have an obligation to abandon their post and deal with that event and then go back once that event is dealt with. Um, there was another slide that got mixed up possibly, but anyways, we had a breakdown of all the eligibilities of what the events were. So we've done it for hockey games, outside concerts, uh, we've done it for even large parties that have been done, not privately, but let's say we've had Lethbridge College, the university, things like that. Um, we've done that for those. We've done it for something as small as a, a cheerleading contest that we've went out and helped. If people feel that there's a risk or a need for anything like that, you can submit your, um, your plan of uh, what's going on to our HR department and we'll address it and we'll see if the need is there for how many officers and we'll go for it for that. That's basically all the information I had about the pay duty. It's quite self-explanatory. If you have any further questions, you can reach out to the police service and we'll direct you to our HR department and we'll help you going forward. Thank you. Hi folks, my name is Dawn Lighty. I'm with the Island Arts Council of Lethbridge. I'm also uh, a volunteer within our community. I have sat on the Canada Day Committee a number of years ago. I sit on the Upper Victoria Park Labor Day Committee. I don't know if any of you know, it's on 7th Avenue. It's a massive festival in June. And then I also help some of our arts, community, uh, arts groups within the community plan concerts. So events from 50 people to 5,000, I've had some experience. So I was going to talk on best practices or lessons learned from a, an organizer perspective. And certainly, I think it's been discussed, at least with Sarah before, um, and a few other speakers, event liability insurance, in my mind, is an absolute, absolute must. Um, I have a great uh, relationship with folks in the insurance uh, realm. And the best way that they describe it to me is it's the reverse lottery. So you're paying in month after month, year after year for your premium. Uh, and if everything goes well with your events year after year after year and you never get a payout, that's fantastic. If something random, really crappy happens to you and there needs to be a payout, it sucks for you, but your event liability insurance is going to be able to help cover that. So please, please, please talk to your insurance provider. Uh, your application will ask you for your estimated attendance. Uh, if you're going to have food and beverage, liquor, which we've talked about with AGLC, that does add uh, additional layers of security and uh, protection. Also, an increase in your premium. 
Uh, it's going to ask if you have trampolines or inflatable jumping pillows, bouncy castles, and again, that's going to add another layer. So Upper Victoria Park, we have a bouncy castle because it's kid-friendly, but we make sure that we have extra volunteers stationed all day long at the bouncy castle to ensure that there's no incidences. Your, insur uh, your insurance application is going to ask for your safety measures, and I'm going to talk a little bit later on. I have some really good resources. And then they're also going to ask you your experience in, in producing these kinds of events. They're going to ask you, you should be asking uh, to cross ensure the city. Sarah spoke about that already. But also if you have food trucks, if you're a bouncy castle person, if you have um, a circus troupe who comes out and does the aerials, ask them to be providing you with a copy of their insurance and cross ensure them. Give that information to your insurance company. And your, your insurance liability is also gonna, or sorry, your, your application is gonna ask you for your safety and security plan, and I think that was talked about earlier. We'll talk a little bit more about resources there. Um, and then if you are looking for um, an insurance provider, the folks over at Avon Insurance are absolutely stellar. Uh, Nikki Furman is, uh, is great with events. Uh, AGLC, again, if you're doing anything with liquor, um, it's absolutely imperative that you talk with the AGLC. Uh, they have a variety of different um, licenses that you can be applying for. They're going to be asking you for a site map, which we've talked about, and I'll talk a little bit more later. Again, they have very specific uh, requirements in terms of security and supervisors, and they're also going to be asking you that your folks are certified with ProServe. And that's, uh, it's a certification to allow your, your supervisors and your bartenders to be aware of any kind of risk involved in serving liquor. It's $25. A lot of organizations that I work with, they have their volunteers take up the ProServe and then the organization pays that $25 certification. It's also good for five years. Um, our Upper Victoria Park Neighbor Day Committee is, um, so we have 5,000 people, we have a lot of pieces to our event. The new thing that we're doing that we feel has really been beneficial with our event is we actually have someone on our committee that is specifically risk management. It has been helpful to have someone, as Sarah talked about, it's not the glory piece. We want to have fun, we want to have a festival, we want to have food trucks. But to have someone on the committee always looking at everything that we're doing in the lens of risk has been immensely helpful. Uh, we set up a stage with musicians, but we need to borrow power from our neighbors. Having that electrical cord covered by one of those ramps that you can get from Ward's Rental, that person's going to go out and take care of that for you. So you don't have to worry about someone tripping, falling, and breaking their leg. Um, one of the resources that I did find when I was doing um, research and to prepare, and I actually noticed quite a few municipalities move in this direction, is to actually develop a risk management plan and the municipalities are starting to ask for this when you are applying for your special event permit. Questions that they're asking, what might be an example for a task, an issue or a hazard, what could possibly go wrong, who's involved, where is it going to happen, what is your risk rating, what are your risk control measures, uh, who's going to be taking care of that, how will it be monitored, and additional notes. So the example here, there's a vehicle in an off-road park area. What could go wrong is the child runs in front of the vehicle. The person's location affected is the general public, the event attendees, your risk rating is medium. And then from there, you can imagine that the rest of the information is around how are you going to be able to be at risk. If you're interested, I can send a link. And then the following, I'm just going to touch on a few things that uh, we've learned, I've learned in terms of best practices within uh, planning events. A site map has been talked about, it's absolutely critical. I find when you are planning an event that you absolutely know where everything is happening within your venue, whether it's in a park, whether it's in a, in a facility like this, whether it's in a church. You need to know where your exits are, your entrances, your washrooms. Uh, this is required for your insurance application. If you're doing HLC, you need it. The city needs it. Uh, it's a great way if you are familiar with the site to walk in it while you're creating that site plan. One of the things that we do with Upper Victorian Park, 
is that we do have an information booth, and that is part of our site plan. This is where we typically, uh, we do actually have St. John's come for us, and we set them up right next door. Um, and your info booth, and we have it very clearly marked, we see it as our, our command center. So all of our volunteers are there. Um, all of our phone numbers, Sarah had a list of phone numbers. These are really things that just to be thinking about if there was an event to happen, an incident to happen, who to call, you go to the info booth. Uh, and a piece of another document that I find that is really helpful is a timeline of events. So if you are multi events within one day, to have that timeline, who's associated with that, what are their contact numbers, and again, your information booth has that information so that if someone needs to find somebody, you can do it very quickly. This has been discussed before about having very specific people designated at your event. Uh, the events that I've been involved with. We actually have the chairs of those subcommittees have to be in attendance, and they have their phone number, you have your lanyard, those phone numbers are people there. So your food vendor coordinator is also on site, not just your safety security person. If you do have someone in your committee who does take care of media, who want to just come in and ask some questions, you have your media person there. I have found that event signage has been extremely helpful. Not only is it a great way to brand your event and to gather community support, but it's a great way for participants and spectators to clearly identify where the information booth is, where the washrooms are, where first aid is. I've also found that uh, brand and name tags for volunteers and staff have been really helpful. Participants then know right away if you have a lanyard with a very specific color tag that that's a person I can go to and ask for help. And then also on the back side, having a list of phone numbers so that if you are out on the street, if you're walking around, if there's something there, you can call someone right away. Making sure that your cell phones are charged up or if you have two big radios, that you have those as well. I also like to take volunteers and provide them with a little bit of an orientation before the event. Certainly if it's a venue where they've not been before, do a bit of a walkabout. Familiarize the volunteers with your exits, with your washrooms, where the information booth is. Again, there was discussion about the level of security needed will vary depending on the type of event and the kind of audience that's attracted. Uh, one thing that we haven't really talked about today that uh, your group should be talking about is uh, creating a process or a plan around if you need to remove someone from your event and you have volunteer security people and if you're not hiring professionals, your volunteers need to be aware of how to remove that person in a calm, collected manner so that they're not creating more of an incident. And then if there is an incident, unfortunately, I always feel that it's best practice to have your volunteers documented in an incident report. That way, depending on the degree of the incident, you can provide that information to the LPS, or if there's further incidences after that, you have a record of what had happened. I spoke quickly about those cords, extra garbage cans, recycling containers so you don't trip on, on garbage. Uh, there was discussion about a uh, financial management system and then making sure that your cell phones are actually charged up so that you can call people. Uh, also, create a contingency plan for uh, weather conditions. Uh, whether or not, and you need to understand or figure out as a group yourself, if you are going to be rained out, are you going to go on with the event? Upper Victoria Park, we went ahead with our event last year. That just meant that the Bouncy Castle ca cancelled and our live musicians are using electric equipment just didn't perform but for the most part it was garage sales and food trucks and we went ahead if your event can't operate in that kind of weather you need to come up with that plan so that that morning at nine o'clock or the night before at ten o'clock when the rain or the wind you need to know what that plan is and then you can always provide opportunity for your patrons to provide feedback so that you can be improving on your event for the next year uh, and then I am a firm believer in uh, having your committee do a debrief after, your, after the event as well. So if you do have an incident happen, you can then learn from it and better prepare for next year. That's it for me.
hot potato. Okay. Thanks, Don. This is all really useful information. I'm glad we're videoing this so that we can hand it off to, obviously, we have all the businesses and organizations and associations that run events every year uh, to be able to go to that video. And this is all you, uh, great uh, information to have on there. I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, marketing and promoting your events, uh, especially downtown businesses or, or associations in the downtown core. Uh, we do have uh, an event calendar on our website that our businesses can uh, upload their information as well as other associations. And I really encourage businesses and associations to reach out to our office to prom promote your event. One of the things that we have access to in the downtown core are a number of poll callers and uh, poster kiosks. There's three kiosks, one at the Southern Albert Art Gallery, one near the Royal Bank, and one near the Public Library for posters. We do have a map in our office. We do have a stapler in the office that we can lend out to uh, groups to get their posters out there. Uh, but just, um, just some of our best practices that we've learned is really take um, heed to what was talked about today as far as event liability insurance, making sure we use St. John's Ambulance for our uh, events, which is really important. Some of the things you don't really think about uh, when you're uh, running an event, it's more excitement about what you're going to be doing there, but I really encourage you to uh, uh, take some of the information you've learned today and apply it to your events because it's very useful. So again, um, any of the business, downtown businesses that are here that are associations that are here, make sure that you uh, take advantage of our website and our social media. We can do a good job of uh, promoting your event leading up to the event, during the event, and uh, covering it after and making sure that you have the best uh, success for your event. So, so thank you.